The way we take care of ourselves is ever evolving. And what we know for sure is that our mind and spirit are linked to our physical body and that our wellness seems to extend into our communities and the planet we all share. It is very, very clear that wellness is interconnected. We love spending time with you to explore and practice the breakthroughs, the insights, and the passions of incredible people helping us all see the world in a whole new light. This is Health Gig. Today on Health Gig, we are so excited to have Dr. Vonda Wright. Our great friend, Mark Middleton from Growing Boulder, suggested that we talk to Dr. Vonda, and boy, was it a great suggestion, and we couldn't wait to bring her to all of you. Dr. Vonda, welcome. Thanks for coming on Health Gig. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled. We were beyond excited when Mark Middleton from Growing Boulder suggested that we meet you. And when we did meet you and studied up on you, it was like, wow, this is an, a one amazing woman. <laughs> Thank you. Aww. And thanks for all the work that you do. Maybe you can just start telling us about who you are and where you grew up and how you became who you are. Absolutely. You know, today, if you, you know, make me cite who I am, I'm a double boarded <laughs> orthopedic surgeon. And by training, my fellowship was in sports medicine. So I have this amazing opportunity to use the tool of mobility, which is walking, running, swimming, using our arms and legs and everything in between, but using it, which is the why of my career, using it for two reasons. Number one, to change the way we age in this country. And number two, to save people from the ravages of chronic disease. And if any of you out there have ever had to go to an orthopedic surgeon, you know for sure that we're skilled at putting metal in bones or fixing ligaments and tendons. But the perspective by doing so, I'm saving people from the ravages of chronic disease is the reason I get up in the morning, frankly. So it's both passions. And then if we go back a little further, my first career in health was as a cancer nurse. And so I bring the perspective as being a very young woman, right out of college, getting a master's degree in cancer nursing, and then treating people in the battle of their lives. And that perspective now flavors everything I do from the way I treat people in a whole person way. If you are a woman of middle age and you come to me with shoulder pain, we are very likely going to be talking about your hormones and your sleep and your brain fog. If you're a man of any age and you're bursting tendons all over the place, we're going to start talking about your testosterone because we are not just one single tissue type. We are a whole person. And I learned that at a very young age by taking care of people who are in the struggle of their lives. But you know what it else has done? It gave me the perspective in my 20s that, you know, some things I just don't care about. Like if you come to my house, I still have the curtains up that the last woman put up when she <laughs> built this house, right? I'm like, they're fine. I'm not going to worry about it because we got lives to save. You know what? It's good and bad. We have six children together. My husband and I have a blended family. And being a mother of that big of a brood has taught me a lot of things. What are the ages? 35 to 15. Wow. I have a grandchild. Oh, you're kidding. No, it's the love of our family's life. We love our kids. But listen, this little chubby boy of ours, he's something. So How old is he? He's about to turn seven months. Adorable. Oh, yeah. congratulations. Thank you. But there's a lot going on in my life. I think your observation is pretty true, but we just function at a lot of levels. Yeah, and accomplish so much and really, really helping so many people. And I think what you talk about in pretty much all of the books, and then you said that you're going to have a couple new books coming out, which I'd love to hear about, is all about really active aging, right? How we can stay, and as Mark Middleton says, how we actually can grow stronger, right? I mean, it's not, not possible, and actually it could be the norm if we choose it to be. There's a tremendous myth in this country, and thank goodness we are rising out of the fog of this myth. But since 2000, when I began studying master's age athletes, being 40 and over athletes, I always believed that the myth in this country, this is the myth, that aging is an inevitable decline from the vitality of youth down a slippery slope to frail and dead, during which we spend 20 years dying, right? So that is what people think it is. And I really push forward to people that actually 
You can do that if you choose to, but you can also choose to be healthy, vital, active, joyful by investing every day in your mobility because of the 34 chronic diseases that we die of that are termed sedentary death syndrome, it's everything you've ever heard of that we die from, right? Including cardiovascular disease, which is the number one killer of men and women in this country. The only pill, the only pill that touches all 34 diseases is mobility. Now, I'm nodding at the nutrition people because I've accepted them as part of my crowd, right? Smart nutrition and mobility. Every disease, because if you have heart problems, you have a pill for that. Hypertension, you have a pill for that. Diabetes, you have several pills and shots for that. But mobility is the one that touches them all. So why wouldn't I be so excited about being a mobility doc? Or as I say to other orthopedic surgeons, you're the gatekeeper of mobility. Get on it, people. Yeah, so that's my philosophy. I love that. And mobility, what does that look like to you in a day-to-day -day basis for regular people? You know, everything counts. And listen, it's not a new skill. Even my little grandson, baby Luca, seven months old, is trying to pull himself up. It is genetically prescribed to us to get up on our feet and move. So what the heck happens to us at a certain age when all of a sudden 12 hours in a chair, you know, I had one woman tell me once, bless her heart, she's like, Dr. Vonda, I don't walk. Well, let's help you walk again. I mean, meaning that she did not care to walk. Sitting was her chosen mobility. But everything matters, whether you're fidgeting all day, whether you're getting up and down from your desk, whether you walk for 10 minutes after every meal, which I suggest because it helps with our insulin sensitivity, all the way up to the elite sports or really being a high-level recreational athlete. All of it counts. But I think people get stuck at the gate when they say, oh, I'm not a pro athlete, I'm not a even a high level recreational. I can't remember the last time I really propelled myself. Listen, there is never, never an age or a skill level when we cannot change the trajectory of our health with mobility. And I'm not just making that up. Listen, the very first studies that were done proving this were done by a scientist named Maria Fiatarone in 90 year old men living in a nursing home. And she put them in chairs and they did chair exercises to increase their mobility and they increased their functional capacity 150%. Everything matters. So that really lowers the barriers to entry, right? If that means getting up from your chair 10 times, because you've never gotten up before. I'll start with that. I'll take that. Right, There's no right. shame in that. And talk to us about the lean muscle mass study that you're a oh, part of. Right. This is just amazing. It's fascinating. So I study master's age athletes 40 and over, and I wanted to address the number one complaint, which is feeling weak and not being able to do what you used to be doing because you feel weak, right? So what does that mean? I want to carry all 10 bags of groceries in on one arm when I get out. You know, I'm just right, grocery right. shop. I want to <laughs> empty the trunk and get inside. Or maybe it's being able to walk up the stairs at work. Whatever it is to you, I want to be able to do it. But a common complaint is I just feel weak. You know, I can't do what I used to do. So I wanted to answer the question, well, what happens to us? if we invest every day in our mobility. So if we look at population studies, meaning let's just take a cross section of the US population, we get the idea that we do get weaker with age, that we do slow down significantly with age. But what do we know about our population? Patricia, we know that 70% of people do not invest in their mobility. So the answers to research done in the population are answers and projecting a future that is sedentary. So my studies take the variable of sedentary living out, and I only study people who invest in their mobility every day. Now, they're not pro athletes. I don't study pro athletes. I study everyday people like you and me, educators, executives, teachers, people who just invest in their mobility. And you know what I found in this lean muscle mass study? I'm sure people out there have had MRIs. So I did MRIs of the thighs of people from 40 to 85. Now, for lack of a better description, when you take an MRI, you get slices, like slices of bread, except slices of a person in pictures. So in a 40-year-old triathlete, when you take a slice picture, you see gorgeous, uh, and I'll post this picture when you release this podcast, gorgeous 
quad muscle structure. It looks like muscle. Hamstrings. You have a very thin rind of subcutaneous fat, teeny tiny. And when I look inside the muscle with fancy NIH software, it is not marbled. Our muscles are not Colby beef. They are flank steak, <laughs> right? Right. With that picture, right? What happens if we then sit around for 35 years? And, you know, not because we're lazy, because we're sitting around. We do desk jobs. We then don't go out and invest in our mobility. Well, here's what happens. We turn to rump roast. We have a huge rind of subcutaneous fat. Our muscle loses all architecture and we become more Kobe than Kobe beef, right? And we're weak. We can't even get up off a chair without huffing and puffing, right? That is not the end of the story. That is the end of the story for people who do not invest every day in their mobility. If you do, whether it's competitive or not competitive, and challenge yourself, in the last picture that I published with this study, the 70-year-old athletes, triathletes, recreational, just doing his thing, slice looks like the 40-year-old slice. Wow. Amazing muscle architecture, very little peripheral fat, no marbling, right? And strong as ever. Why is that important? Well, it's important because we want to live the life we've always lived, but it's also important because muscle is a key player in metabolism and overall health, number one. Number two, if we lose our muscle strength, we are more likely to fall down and break a bone. And here's not me being a death angel, but I'm gonna tell you for sure that I'm an orthopedic surgeon and take care of people who fall down. When men and women fall down in their 60s, 70s, and 80s and break a hip, which can happen because of poor lean muscle mass, 50% of you will not return to pre-fall function, meaning you can't live in the house you raised your kids in, 30% of you will die and not on my watch. I get very serious when people ask me to talk about fracture risk and falling down muscle and bone health because people think it's an inconvenience. No, it can be a life-changing, devastating, permanent problem. So if we can prevent it by maintaining our lean muscle mass, it's worth it. Muscle is metabolically critical. It is critical for not falling down and maintaining our bones. But staying active every day is really critical for not developing diabetes and subsequently Alzheimer's disease, right? We now believe that diabetes is a precursor to Alzheimer's disease due to insulin insensitivity. So it just adds on to the reason we need to invest every day. Because listen, people, fat, as I've described in rinds of peripheral fat, it's not just hanging out in inconvenient places. Fat adipose tissue, which is so cute on babies in adults, is a noxious metabolic organ that secretes something called adipokines that poison you. It prevents you from building lean muscle mass. I mean, I could go on and on about the dangers of fat. And Patricia, I hope people hear me when I'm saying, I could care less about your little black dress, whether it fits or not. I could care less about whether you show up at your high school reunion looking 18 again, please. You know, who's still looking back at that, right? I care about not being covered and slathered in fat because it's going to kill you. It has nothing to do with cosmetics. It has everything to do with metabolic health. You know, when you put it like this, it's almost like it is imperative. As you're saying, it's a choice. We do have a choice. And you're not even saying you have to walk X amount of miles a day. You don't have to do X amount of steps a day. You're saying just get up and start moving and make sure it's a big part of your day and then get to the place of where you're measuring. All right. So I do have really specific guidelines for my patients, but if we're doing nothing, let's just do it. You've been doing it since you were one year old. You know how to do this. Get up and take a walk. Even my friends, even, I know your knees hurt. I know it. I see you every day. But if you have access to water, like a pool, or even if you don't have one, because I'm in Florida now, like there's one on every street corner, right? But what if you're in the North? Well, there's YMCAs all over the place that have free pools. You get in chest high water and the resistance of the water is miraculous for taking care of your body. Or you could get on a bike or you could get on an elliptical. Knee hurting is not an excuse. What if your shoulder hurts? Oh my gosh, you've got one good shoulder and two good legs left, right? In 25 years of taking care of people, there are very few excuses that I have not heard and I've got an answer for each one of them. But it comes down to what do you want, Patricia? 
yesterday in my clinic twice because listen, I really have heard all the excuses and I love my people and we hug each other all the time. But sometimes I just say, listen, you have a choice. Do you want to be in pain or do you want to cut out the sugar? Which was yesterday's conversation with somebody. Would you rather have pain? You just keep doing what you're doing. I heard you talk about sugar and of course I'm a sugar person. So when I heard you talking about it, I'm like, wow, it did help shift me a little bit. So maybe you can talk to all of us about sugar. (laughs) Listen, I come to this conversation about sugar and it's a rare day. I don't have dark chocolate in my desk drawer. I do not today, but I come to this conversation about sugar completely guilty. I love sugar. My brain loves sugar. It loves the dopamine burst I get from it. I'd rather eat cookies for breakfast. But listen, just like I told my patient that they had a choice, I had a choice. And so I gave up refined sugar. Now, it doesn't mean I don't eat carbs. I mean, I lift a lot of heavy weights and I do a lot of zone two training. So I need complex carbs. And we can talk about those things if you want. But pure refined cane sugar, beet sugar, fruit juice, fruit smoothies, You know, holy cow, if you want to spike your glucose, send your little mitochondria into insulin shock, wear out your pancreas, flood your tissues with sugar, which will make you inflamed and sore, you go right ahead. But if you want to not feel your body like you did when you were in your 20s or 30s, I'm going to encourage you to read labels because even things like I was choosing yogurt in the store the other day and I looked on the back and it said 30 grams of added sugar per serving. I'm like, what are we doing here? We have to know what's going in our bodies. We have to read labels. We have to reject simple sugar. And for a while, I would put my patients through a 10-day sugar detox and coach them through every day where we just stopped cold turkey because I'm not somebody who can wean myself off. I'm either eating sugar or I'm not eating sugar. And the first time I did this, I don't know why I chose to do it on the weekend of Thanksgiving when I was 47 (laughs) years old, which was the first time I did it because I was getting perimenopausal, so inflamed from that anyway. I cut sugar and here's what happened in one month. Before I stopped eating simple sugar and simple carbs, I was aching all the time. I, I could barely get out of bed. When I got out of bed, I was like hobbling to the bathroom. I stopped sugar and within about five days, I didn't feel my body. It is that acute. When you get rid of that inflammation, you'll feel better. And number two, do you know what happened? I lost 12 pounds because Americans eat 16 pounds of added sugar every month and don't even know it because of everything that's added into packaged food. It was the easiest lifestyle change I ever made in terms of losing. I wasn't even really trying to lose weight, but that's what happens. I have patient after patient after patient when I have this conversation with them in my office, because remember, I'm a whole person doctor, that when they start paying attention to not only what's going in by reading labels, when they start eating appropriate size portions, even without giving up a lot of stuff they love, they're losing weight. They feel amazing. And I know people are fixated on losing weight. It's not about that for me, but to meet people where they are, it happens when you start paying attention. And as you say, if you get the inflammation down, things start changing and the cravings stop. Oh yeah, in three days. Yeah, just you gotta just get on it. (laughs) And your taste buds change. Literally, people think it takes forever. Here's how it's gonna go. Day one, you're gonna do it on sure willpower because you're strong enough. Day two, you're like, oh, I did it day one. I'm not going to do it day two. Day three, your brain's going to say, what the what? I need a dopamine spike. And you are not even going to know why you are standing in front of your pantry with the doors open looking for something. You don't even know what you're looking for. You're going to stand there like, what did I come here for? And your brain's going to want some sugar. You just close those doors and you walk away, people. Because day four and day five are pure discipline. Willpower will not get you there discipline. I am worth the daily investment. I do not want to feel in pain. And I'm going to tell you for sure, because I have done this, that by about day five, six, seven, your taste buds change and you don't crave it as much anymore. It's not easy, but you're worth it. And then you will see rapid change. And to decrease the inflammation in your body, it's not only about pain. It's not only about metabolic health. It's about your aging. Right. And can you explain that? Yeah, so we're basically baking on the inside through a process called glycolation, which has to do with our tissues aging. And in the presence of greater sugar load, we do that faster. 
We cook faster from the inside out. So inflammation is one of the known pillars of aging. So anything we can do to become less inflamed, I tell my patients, we're going to eat an anti-inflammatory diet. Well, what does that mean? Basically, it means lots of green leafy and lean protein, whether you get your protein from animal sources, which I happen to, or whether you're a tofu person or get it all from lentils and beans, lean protein and green leafy. That is an anti-inflammatory, creating an anti-inflammatory milieu. So I'm not actually telling you, although we did spend a long time talking about the badness of sugar, but I'm more encouraging people to exchange their diets for more green leafy. And you know what? At the beginning, eat your carrots, eat your beets, eat anything that's brilliantly colored that does not come from a box, right? And then as you get used to it, then we're going to eliminate the really high sugar parts of that. Fruit will become a dessert, not what we start with. Fruit is all fructose people. So we want to treat it like dessert after we have had all the green leafy and lean protein that we actually need. Okay, that's good. And like you said, it's not complicated. We have to just start and we just have to be aware and just try. (laughs) I think though, you know, to give people a little bit of grace and credit, I mean, this is a multi-generational problem in this country because if your great grandmother fed your grandmother a certain way, and then your mother fed you a certain way, and it's just what our family does, and everybody in our family, I'm doing air quotes, is big boned, there are changes to a new normal which the new normal is not necessarily healthy. And by the way, people, there's no such thing as big boned. Can we dispel that? Bones weigh 15% of your total lean body weight. You may have bigger wrists than the next person, but in terms of blaming big bonedness on giving you permission to carry around an extra 100 pounds, choose another reason, right? It's not your bones. But it can be generational in terms of this is what you learned from your family. It's just what you know. So maybe you don't know. Because I find, you know what, honestly, Patricia, I give the same kind of grace to accountants who come into my office about their knees or about their hips or about any musculoskeletal system. And they're asking really basic questions. I'm like, what do you mean you don't know where your knees are? But you know what? I give them grace because I don't balance my checkbook. You know what? We can't be experts at everything. So maybe the generational dishealth, subhealth we have in this country has to come from education and what we've seen people we love do. And that's why I think your books are so fabulous. And tell everybody why you decided to write them and why they really are information that we can use and live by. It's actually written for us, not the medical community, right? That's right. Well, just so all you academic people out there know that, yes, I was an academic surgeon for 20 years and I've written a textbook on the topic. So I've done my job. I've done the research. I've written the textbook. It's called Masterful Care of the Aging Athlete. But every other book, four other books and all my videos, if you Google me, it's for you. Because here's the thing. If I see a hundred patients a week in my clinic, I see people two and a half days a week in my clinic and I do surgery one day a week. I only see about 100 people. Only 100 people then are going to benefit from my passion and knowledge that mobility can save your life, right? But I think that I could have been equally as happy as a teacher, you right? You see that. I can't help it. I'm teaching all the time, whether people want me to or not. So writing books for the public does that. So I wrote the first book, I think it was 2006 or something, called Fitness After 40. And it was written based on the research of all the national senior games people I had studied. And it's really a playbook. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. it. here's pictures of me doing it and some friends of mine doing it. And here's some equipment. I designed some equipment. But here's the deal. How funny is it that in 2006, even 40-year-olds couldn't stand the number 40? So I had to rebrand my message from fitness after 40 to thrive. So my second book is called Guide to Thrive. And what it is, it's a workbook almost. People describe it as a workbook to build a strategic plan for your health. And it uses the business model steps. It's four steps. Create a vision based on who you know you are and what you want. Because without a vision, we just have a pile of bricks. And when it comes to health, that's the grapefruit diet, the soup diet, the whatever diet, you know, name a diet, right? Or this exercise plan or high intensity interval training. Without a strategic plan, you have a pile of bricks and not a monument. So create a vision. Number two, take action. That's obvious. Number three, 
you have to understand what your barriers are. What is keeping you from doing what you know you should do? And you know what it is, my friend? It is the five and a half inches between our ears. Nothing but your brain is forcing you not to act in a way that you know is good for you. And then finally, after you create a vision, take action, assess what the barriers are. You then evaluate and reward yourself, right? So that's what Guide to Thrive is all about. It has a six-month plan for nutrition and working out because I found from my first book that sometimes we do best with an actual daily instruction, not just here's some options. So that was Fitness After 40, Guide to Thrive. And then the third book was written in collaboration with the people from Prevention Magazine, and it's called Younger in Eight Weeks. And we actually designed an eight-week plan. We tested it in a bunch of women, and those women really loved it. So each of these books, as you see, is written to equip you as the individual to live healthy, vital, active, joyful, and not succumb to this terrible myth that aging is going to happen anyway. Aging is going to happen anyway. But how we do it is our choice. And I think that we can have that mindset and that it is the health span versus the lifespan, really, that we're going for. And you've described that so eloquently. Can you explain that? At the turn of the 19th century, so 1900, the life expectancy in this country was 40 years old, right? We didn't live very long for a lot of reasons, industrial problems, health problems. 40 years old is how long men lived. We don't know how long women lived. They didn't keep data on us for whatever reason, (laughs) right? So men lived to 40. Now the life expectancy in this country is 79 years old for men and about 81 for women. And listen, Japan, it's almost 85. So they're doing something right. But the devastating data that I keep reading, I keep reading is that our life expectancy is declining in this country. But even so, we're living to be about 80. But what is our health span? The health span is defined as the number of years that you are free from the ravages of chronic disease. Even if you have been diagnosed before, it's not till about, here's the number, 62, that all those diseases start forcing you to go to the doctor two or three times a week. So I say to you, what is your choice? Do we get ahead of our health span and start telling our younger brothers and sisters in their 30s and 40s, and my younger brother is 50? We have some critical decades here. I think the critical decade is your 40s when we're finally adult enough to understand, have some time. Hopefully we have a little experience in our jobs. It is critical that we get in front of what is going to happen to you if we do not take control of the things we can because health span on average in this country is 62 years, but your life expectancy is 80. So if people listening out there, I realize there are things that we cannot control any minute. I could be hit by a card, be diagnosed with cancer, those things. But on average, we have control. And I don't know how you want to die, Patricia, but I have the most amazing example now of a real life person. I want to die like Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth (laughs) was 97 years old. And on Tuesday, she put on her outfit with her little purse on her arm and met the prime minister as she had always done. And on Thursday, she just laid down and didn't get up. That is exactly what I want to do. Live, 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 live. Go to sleep. Because we don't get this back. These days we don't get back. You're right. And when you understand that at that level that you're explaining right now, it makes it a little bit easier not to eat that sugar tomorrow because you get it. You begin to understand it at a different level. And it's not that hard. You know what? I think that all of us, me, media, the public, maybe even some scientists with three-hour podcasts that the vocabulary nobody can understand. I mean, I listen to it and I have to listen to it two or three times and I am a scientist. Listen, it's not rocket science. I start my patients out on two or three things that I know are going to make the biggest difference because once we conquer those, then we can get complicated. But until we see a modicum of success and feel empowered that we can make the choices 1,440 times a day, that's how many minutes there are in a day, we have a very hopeful opportunity every minute to make a choice that puts us in a direction of healthy, vital, active, joyful. I mean, I think it's a very hopeful message because sometimes we think aging is just this abysmal thing. But I learned this from my own parents. My parents are 83. They live with us. My dad has been an endurance athlete my whole life. He's got a total hip and now and a bum knee. He still walks six miles a day. I never know where he is. 
where are you? Oh, I walked to the gym today. I love that. He is living proof. My mother grew up in a generation where women did not exercise. They didn't sweat. She got her first sprained ankle after she got her bilateral total knees in Zumba. <laughs> I mean, there's never That's an age so when we crazy. can't start if my little mother, and I say little because, you know, she's shrunk in her age, can do it, right? We can all do it. What are your thoughts on like a hormone replacement therapy? I take hormone replacement therapy. I think that the Women's Health Initiative study that shut down hormone replacement in this country, according to the original authors, which I just heard on another podcast, was misinterpreted. But what it did, no matter whose fault it was or what happened, it not only shut down access to estrogen, which can very amazingly change the trajectory of a woman's perimenopause and menopause, but from an orthopedic surgery standpoint, it blocked access for many women to the life-changing estrogen that can prevent frailty fracture, that can preserve lean muscle mass, and can prevent tendon injury, and frankly, people, the progression of arthritis, which is greatest in women over 50 compared to men. Estrogen will preserve the musculoskeletal system. And I'm very passionate about it because how dare you take that away from me? Because what we know now is that for most women, there is very little risk. It's been proven time and time again. There are some for whom should be counseled not to take it. A resource I refer everyone to, and I wish I got royalties from this book, I refer to it so often, is the book Estrogen Matters by Carol Tavris and Avram Blooming, who are two scientists that put together all the research that existed at the time of the writing as to the risk factors of taking estrogen for every disease, heart disease, breast cancer, everything. I'm a big supporter for women who choose to do that, but every woman needs to make that decision for herself. Does it matter the age that someone would start the estrogen or can you start at any age? No, the North American Menopause Society, which has a great website, people should refer to it, recommends that you start home and replacement therapy within 10 years of your menopause. Now remember, menopause is one day right? So I call the decade between 35 and 45, the critical decade to get your proverbial stuff together. I would swear, but I don't know your audience. <laughs> proverbial stuff together. It's the calm before the storm because at about 45, the average onset of perimenopause and estrogen is fluctuating wildly and we become estrogen dominant when our progesterone declines, all the things, right? We want to get ahead of that in the critical decade. Once perimenopause starts, you can control that with estrogen, even if you're still having periods, whether you do it with low dose birth control, with frank hormone replacement, every woman on estrogen replacement therapy that has a uterus must also be on progesterone. So that's that. That's the critical decade, 35 to 45, I like to talk about. Then perimenopause starts around 45. The average age for menopause in this country it is earlier in underdeveloped countries, it is earlier in African American women, but on average is 51. Menopause is the one day that you are 366 days after your last period. And then for the rest of your life, your postmenopausal, you must start estrogen within 10 years of your day of menopause because then the risks do increase according to good studies. So there's a lot of time span where you can take estrogen if you choose to, or, you know, there are a lot of things you can do to support your menopause symptoms. I've started a support line of supplements, I guess they fall under that give you all the micronutrients you need because my diet's not perfect. I try really hard. It's hard to get everything. So but I did want to talk about the supplements and what yeah. do you recommend? Yeah, absolutely. Under a brand called Nova MD, which Nova means new, we're in a new time of life. We're not just older younger women where you have a completely new life because our chemistry is different. We've put a really good multivitamin in this package. We then added augmenting things like ashwagandha, matcha, green tea, and then we added a proprietary ingredient distilled from rhubarb that acts directly on our estrogen beta receptors, which are one of our three estrogen receptors to really try to diminish some of the symptoms we have, but also control some of the belly fat that we accumulate due to the increased cortisol levels that happen. So, you know what? I just couldn't take 19,000 supplements. So I put it all in one bottle for myself and those who choose to follow it. So it's called Advanced Menopause Support by Nova MD. 
then we made a second formulation for energy. You know, lots of us are low energy for many reasons. Frankly, many women are under calorie. They think we can only eat a thousand calories a day, which is going to make you low energy. But our energy supplement has vitamin B12, it has selenium and copper, but it also has an ingredient called NMN, which is converted in our bodies to an energy source called NAD+. So in our cells, little bitty organelles, remember from biology class, these little round balls called mitochondria are our powerhouses and they convert all types of fuel to our primary fuel, which is called ATP. Our body needs NAD plus for that reaction. In our supplement cellular rewind formula, we give people that building block, which is called NMN. We're just trying to support women. It's tough out there during the critical decade and the perimenopause, but I promise, I do promise, ladies, I'm 56. It does get better. It can get better. But you know what? You deserve the information. You deserve to seek it out. Everything is figure outable. Think about what you figured out in your life. Menopause is figure outable. Lots of good resources now these days. And you know, I want to encourage your women to also demand the health care that they want. DEXA scans in this country are paid for by insurance when you turn 65. What the what? We can lose 20% of our bone density around perimenopause. What are we waiting on? I write DEXA scan prescriptions for all of my women when they have symptoms. If they fractured before, if their mothers are shrinking, if you know you have a history of fracture yourself, if you know you have risk factors, if you're petite or fair, you are at risk for osteoporosis. Why are we waiting until after we've lost 20% of our bone density to figure it out? So for our younger sisters and our daughters, lay down some bone until you're 30. You got to get out there and bash your bones and jump up and down and eat healthy food. And then we need to maintain our bone density. I've had women, Patricia, who break their femurs in their 20s. I had two women last week, one with a femoral neck fracture, one with a it's called a tibial plateau fracture, just because a frailty of the bones. They didn't fall down. They had frail bones. So if your doctor or if your insurance will not pay for a DEXA scan and you want one, I suggest that you pay for it yourself. You can find imaging centers where they will just charge you cash. The most I've ever heard of is $250. Some are as low as 70 get a DEXA scan. So at least you know how at risk your bones are. And if they're healthy, then you can do all the things that I suggest to women like lift heavy weights, do impact exercise. If they're frail bones already, then we need to know so that we can do better for them and really try to maintain them. I had a woman who was doing the best she could. She thought she was doing all the right things, which she would have been if she had healthy bones. But what she did not realize is that she was already osteoporotic in her late 40s and she broke her femur lifting heavy weights because she was trying to do the right thing, right? So we have to know, boy, I'm on such a soapbox, Patricia, get a DEXA scan. Number two, today, this very day, I got my mammogram. It wasn't time for my mammogram, but I'm a postmenopausal woman and my left breast was hurting. And you don't sit around when that starts. You don't just hope that it's okay. There is no reason for a postmenopausal woman without estrogen fluctuating every month. You know, all of our breasts get sore when we're having periods. There is no reason. So you know what I did? I demanded, I didn't demand, I asked and got one, a diagnostic mammogram. And it's fine, audience, it's fine. Thank God, but I would rather know. So I just encourage your audience to ask for what they want to know why they want it, to continue seeking what you want. Because doctors, unfortunately, are very confined by insurance companies who take your money every month. And then sometimes to get a test that the doctor wants for you, they have to make multiple phone calls. It's not right and it's not fair. Sometimes you have to be your best advocate and ask for what you want. And this even applies to hormone replacement therapy. If your doctor says no, go do your own research. Come in with a stack of articles and say, this is why I want this. Or go to the North American Menopause Society and find a menopause 
certified doctor who you don't have to educate. And please, doctors out there, I'm not anti-doctor. I'm a doctor. I love doctors. <laughs> we work our proverbial butts off. But we should not be confined to the limitations of insurance if we know it's something our patients could benefit from. Okay. So DEXA scan, and like you said, just know where you stand on things and then you can deal with it because you can deal with it. Tell us about your stem cell lab. I grew up on a farm in Kansas where my parents, no, we weren't farmers. We inherited the land. But what it did teach me by having a five acre garden and having two very hardworking parents was I know how to work. So when you say, oh, you've done so much, I really have, but I've worked my proverbial <laughs> fingers to the bones. It's the way I'm programmed. So one of the things I had fortune to be part of when I was at the University of Pittsburgh for 20 years was access and co-leadership of a lab called the Control Lab, the Clinical Translation and Research Laboratory, which in that lab, every question that we ask in the laboratory had a clinical coordinate, a correlate, like what are we doing about this in people? So I'll tell you about one of those studies. But I also had the really amazing opportunity to be in the lab of Dr. Johnny Huard, who's one of the world's leading stem cell researchers. And guess what stem cell we researched? The very famous right now satellite cells, muscle-derived stem cells. At the time, we it was in the 2000s, we didn't know that they were called satellite cells or what exactly they did, but we sure researched it. And so today, when we see all the, even the consumer-based information about how impact exercise or maintaining our lean muscle mass or taking estrogen can help preserve our satellite cells, which is our muscle stem cells, I think to myself, oh my God, I've been studying this since 2000. So here's what we know about them. Impact exercise, lifting heavy weights, estrogen replacement can stimulate the production and maintenance of your muscle-derived stem cells, your satellite cells, which are therefore critical for metabolism and long life. But how does that work, right? So I observed in that study, I already told you that on a muscle tissue level, we can maintain that with mobility every day. But Dr. Fabrici Ambrosio and I, who ran the control lab, wanted to know why. So we found two things. So, and I can post this too when you put yes. this out, but you know, in our laboratory, we had treadmills for mice. So we took these little old lady mice, little old lady <laughs> mice are two years old. They're just, you know, they have had a good life. They're waiting around for their next meal. They're sitting in their rocking chairs and we biopsied their little muscle and found that their satellite cells had programmed themselves to die. Death is an active process. You have to turn on genes to die. They had stopped replicating and they've gone from fat little grape-like cells to spindly shrunken raisin cells and they were not producing growth factors. Then we took these old gals and we put them on our treadmills and we encouraged them to run twice a day for two weeks. Now, mice don't want to exercise any more than the rest <laughs> of us. So we encouraged them and they did it. After two weeks, we rebiopsied their little muscles and we found that their satellite cells, their stem cells, had gone from spindly, raisiny cells to fat little grape cells again. They were pouring out growth factors. They had turned off the cells that were transcribing death proteins. Oh my gosh. I know. And do you know how we <laughs> use that data? Knowing that we can turn on the fountain of youth satellite cells with a little bit of exercise. We use that then in humans to prehab people for surgery, to prepare people for a musculoskeletal challenge. We just prehab them to get their stem cells revved up in their muscle. Isn't that fascinating? At a tissue level and even a little stem cell level, we are the masters of our domain, right? We can choose by doing the simple thing we've done since we were as old as little Luca Taglianetti, seven months <laughs> old, which is choosing to walk. It's so fascinating that we really are in control. We can change at a cellular level. But I wasn't satisfied, and neither was Dr. Ambrosio, to know the why. So we observe we can retain muscle structure, we can re stimulate stem cells, but what's going on? So we studied this protein called Clotho. Clotho is the goddess of the thread of life, right? So 30 years ago, the protein Clothos was described. Clothos is the longevity protein that is necessary to keep all organs young, every organ, such that mice that are born without the ability to make this protein Clothos die old, very young, right? They're chronologically young. They die very old. I started studying Clothos levels in my master's athletes, right? Because I'm a clinical scientist. I study people doing things. 
I found that the levels of clothos circulating in my master's athletes was higher than sedentary young people. So I have these 75 year olds whose blood is just teeming with clothos, the longevity protein, much higher than 30 year old sedentary people. Isn't that amazing? That's really interesting. Do you know that true age test? What do you think of that? And do you think they're measuring clotho when you do the true age? I don't think true ages or real age. There's a lot of those biological clock. Um, right. What most of them are doing is there's these things in DNA called SNPs. They're just putting blood over a gene array and oh, seeing okay. what genes are turned on for death or life. Most of them are pretty inaccurate. I'm sorry to say real scientists think they're pretty inaccurate, but you know what? I did one and I used it as a competition because I did it when I was 54 and I was all like, oh my God, it's going to say that I'm 36. Well, it said I was 54. And after being disappointed, I was just glad that it didn't say I was, you know, 10 <laughs> years older than my right, 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 right. So what you're saying is again, that movement is going to have the clothos out and active Movement and moving around. Movement stimulates the transcription in your own cells of the protein clotho. So when you make things from your DNA, it's called transcription. So exercise makes that happen. You mentioned that you're going to have some books for us all to read this summer. I am. So listen, it's been a little while since I published a <laughs> consumer book and I've changed some of what I do. So in my past books, I wrote all about functional lifting, carrying a load, including body weight. And that's amazing. And it's an amazing way to start. But what I advise my patients to do now, especially women, is to lift heavy and really stimulate muscle growth and stem cell growth. So the book that's coming out towards the end of June is called Strong. Four Steps to Body, Brains, and Bliss. And it is a sequel to Guide to Thrive. So if you haven't read that yet, pick it up, get all prepared, and then Strong is going to be out. And I'll have it listed everywhere because now for the first time, I've always published with publishers and I'm giving myself a little chance to self-publish, which is interesting. But it will be on Amazon and all the places. In Strong, Four Steps to Body, Brains, and Bliss, I think people are going to expect that the first chapter is all about weightlifting or the first section about how to be physically strong. But you know what the first section of the book is all about? is about our mindset. Because when I coach people every day or Sherpa them or whatever people call what I do for them, besides, you know, surgery, I find many people stuck trying to face the future by looking backwards. I mean, and it's natural to think back, oh, when I was 20, I did this, or I had a 29-year-old coach in this place I work say, back in the day. And I said, when is back in the day for you? You're 29. <laughs> like, when I was 18. Okay, people, you cannot fully <laughs> embrace the best of life by looking backwards, because I don't know many people in mid-age that would truly want to still be in school, live with their parents, have no money, blah, 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 right? What we're yearning for is the capacity to live the way we want. I contend to you, number one, that the price of experience, experiencing the richness of life, having a lot of wonderful things go on, having worked hard enough to be proud of yourself. The price of experience is aging, and I wouldn't want it any other way. I would not want to go back to being 20 without the experience I have now. I just would not. However, what I would want is to have the capacity to choose. So if I pivot from looking backwards to fully pivoted, facing my future so that I am making the decisions, I am embracing the experience and the marvelous things that I know now that I didn't know then. That's when I truly will live my best life. And that is what the first section of strong is about, a strong brain, both emotionally and physically to go forward. And then the rest of the book is about physical and all the things you would expect it to be. It has an exercise plan and the new way that I prescribe exercise. So strong is coming out. Then in the fall, I have plans to release a book called 40-ish, 40-ish, Everything I Wish I Had Known. Uh, I haven't really fully titled it, but you know what? It's mostly done, but it's called 40-ish because there really is a critical decade to get your SH, et cetera, together. And had I known, and I'm a doctor, had I known, I would have been more prepared. So those are coming out this summer, along with a third one that I co-wrote that has nothing to do with aging or anything, because I'm a sports doctor, by the way. 
It's called Roadmap to Raising Healthy Athletes because we are killing our children in this country by playing them year round, by taking away their childhoods. Sport is not fun anymore. For many kids, millions of children drop out of organized sports when they're 13. And I think sports and activity can save this country from the ravages of chronic disease. So I need our kids to continue to be active throughout their lifespan, but they will not if they drop out when they're 13 because it's not fun or they're hurt. You know, uh, another orthopedic surgeon, Mark Miller from UV and I wrote this book and it's due out in July. So it's been a productive little writing. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say, gosh, amazing. So just a couple last questions. One is, do you think most people are going to have some sort of replacement like hip, knee, shoulder, whatever? Is that kind of an inevitable thing as we age? Or do you think by doing all of this, maybe we don't? Well, number one, knee and hip replacements are arguably the most successful orthopedic procedures ever conceived. And they've been done for about 50 years now and truly can give people their lives back. So that's my basic philosophy. And I do it in younger, younger people because you can get arthritis several ways. You can have rheumatoid arthritis where your body has an autoimmune disease and revolts against itself. You can have a traumatic injury because you are an athlete and at 18, shear the cartilage off your knees or your hips and therefore need a joint replacement sooner than later. Or you can have age-related or weight-related arthritis. Those are all reasons. So is it inevitable? No. I mean, lots of people don't need it. If you do need it, if you can't take the pain or you've got to get your life back, should you get it, you should find a surgeon you trust. You should fully understand the hard work it's going to take on your part. And then I think you should get it because 97% of the time you will get your life back. I don't do hip replacement. I'm a hip arthroscopist, meaning I use arthroscopes in the hip for athletes, but I do replace knees in older athletes. We've had Title IX for 50 years now, right? So (laughs) women as well as men have been athletes their whole life. And when old athletes come to me, I do replace their knees, but with me... A joint replacement is a teamwork. I will coach you. I expect a lot out of you. One of my patients said, well, don't go to her unless you expect to be a full partner. She holds you accountable. But I don't think it's something people should fear. I think they should squelch their fear with knowledge and stop listening to all the horror stories that you hear in the grocery store. That is no way to be educated. Gosh, Dr. Vonda, this has been an incredible conversation. Is there anything that we didn't touch on that we should talk about? Yeah, sometimes when people ask me, is there anything else that you'd like people to understand? Here's what I want people to understand. And I say this in the most serious, passionate, heartfelt way. Until you understand you are worth as a person, the daily investment in your health, nothing else matters and nothing else will motivate you. Well, you will not be motivated by your high school reunion. You will not be motivated by the fact that your children need you to be healthy until you truly understand that you are worth it. Nothing else matters because I believe, and the reason I'm a doctor is not only to change the way we age in this country and to save you from ravages of chronic disease, but I believe that you are worth the daily investment in your own health. That's beautifully said. Thank you. You You're really inspirational. Holy smokes. Incredible. God. Dr. Vonda, also just a great shout out to Mark Middleton for introducing us to you and to this amazing work that you've done and you're doing. You know, thank you to Mark also. Growing Boulder is a great organization. I love working with them. Dr. Vonda, thank you for being so inspirational and for all the work that you've been doing. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well. Precision medicine is a genetics-based approach to personalized care informed by biometrics, genomics, and lifestyle factors. Dr. Dawson, founder, CEO of Wild Health, can bring you incredible recommendations for diet, exercise, sleep, mental health, disease risk reduction, and more based on your personal health story. All of you are invited to get to know Matt Dawson better beside the ocean and over some incredible meals at Gasparilla in November. 
Call for the Foundations of Wellness Experience Reservations at 877-764-1420 or the-gasparilla-in.com.